You know, the two things that uh, the churches of Christ are known for by those who are not members are the fact that we, we don't use instruments of music in our worship. That was pretty obvious this morning for anyone who uh, was paying attention. And we require all to be baptized by immersion. Now it's true that uh, we don't use instruments in our public worship, and it's true that we do place a heavy emphasis on the need to be baptized in order to be saved. Now because of this, some people think that these two features were invented by us, and, and we're like unique you know, in these practices. In other words, you know, that a cappella music and baptism by immersion, you know, that's like a Church of Christ thing, like we started that. For those who are not members of the church, this is understandable. But for us who are New Testament Christians, we need to be able to explain and teach about these things clearly. You see, brethren, baptism is not a, a kind of modern religious invention. It has a history as long as Christianity itself and beyond. And this morning I'd like to review that with you and try to do a few thousand years of history in about 25 minutes, if that's okay. So you'll need to focus, all right? Water has always been used by God in a symbolic way. For example, the flood. He used the flood as an action and a symbol of judgment and purification. Uh, Moses and the Red Sea as a way to freedom for the Jews, as a way of judgment for the Egyptians, as a way to separate life from death for both. Now this symbolism crystallized as the priests were appointed to serve at the tabernacle in the desert, and part of their preparation for service was to bathe in water as a way of demonstrating their purification from the world and their separation for priestly service. If you have your Bibles, go to Exodus chapter 29 and I want to read a brief verse to demonstrate the order in which the priests were put into service. In Exodus 29 it says, Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to me, to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread with unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers spread with oil, you shall make them of fine wheat flour, you shall put them in one basket, and present them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting, and wash them in water. You shall take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod and you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them, and they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute, so you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Now, I want you to note the order here. First, the tabernacle was built. Next, the priestly garments were made. And then the sacrifices were prepared, and then, and then the priests were purified with water and then they put the garments on, and then the sacrifices were offered at the tabernacle. Now in this way, God taught the people to associate water with spiritual cleansing in preparation for entry into His presence and service. And there are other examples of this idea. For example, the washing of hands as a symbol of innocence in Deuteronomy 21 verse six, or to be washed from sin Psalm 51, verse two. Now eventually the Jews extended this symbolic purification to those who were being converted to Judaism. And so by the time of Jesus, if a, if a Gentile embraced the Jewish religion, he was required to do three things. One, be circumcised. Two, take a ritual bath seven days after his circumcision, and then three, offer sacrifice at the temple. That was the process 
uh, that one went through in order to go from being a Gentile converted to the Jewish faith. So the idea of purification associated with water was not only a Jewish concept, it was also practiced among Gentiles as well. For example, the Oriental mystery religions of the East required a ceremonial cleansing in water and sometimes in rushing water, a rushing stream, in order to be admitted to the secret sect or to the secret religion, if you wish. So the point I'm making here is that by the time of John the Baptist and, and Jesus and the apostles, the association of water and moral purification or new birth or sanctification was a familiar concept in the minds of both Jews and Gentiles. This was nothing, nothing new. And so let's talk about baptism in the New Testament beginning with John the Baptist. The first mention of baptism in the New Testament is through the preaching of John the Baptist. And his preaching was a mixture of the old and the new. Some of the old teaching was that his life and style of preaching was like the prophets of old. He was a desert preacher, if you wish. He was a hellfire type preacher. Jesus compared him to Elijah in Matthew 17. He also commanded that the people be purified from their old sinful lives through water, through baptism. An idea that they were already familiar with from the Old Testament and from current practice. Then there was some new teaching involved the promises of the Old Testament that a Messiah was coming were about to be fulfilled. And he referred to this as the kingdom being at hand. That's what John preached. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and be baptized. Now when the Savior came, he would purify them not with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Matthew 3.11. So the meaning of this became clearer as Jesus and his apostles began their ministry and their preaching. Now let's fast forward to Jesus and, and his ministry. We see that baptism figures prominently in Jesus' work because it is the very first event that takes place in his public ministry in Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 to 16. John baptizes him at his insistence and the Father speaks from heaven and the Holy Spirit appears in the form of a dove. And did you realize that this is the only place in Scripture where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit appear simultaneously to men? So a new element is added here, that baptism is not only for purification, but also a way to respond to the will of the Father. In other words, a way to respond to God in doing His will, in doing what is right. We know that Jesus had no sin. He had no need of purification, but He needed to do the will of the Father perfectly. And so baptism was thus shown to be a command of God and Jesus was willing to submit to it in order to demonstrate His perfect obedience. Now the people did it to show obedience and to be purified. Jesus did it to demonstrate his obedience to the Father. So after John's imprisonment and death, Jesus' ministry of miracles and teachings begins to accelerate. He continues with John's preaching theme of the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the practice of baptism, but he now proclaims that the kingdom of God is not just coming, but is now at hand. Matthew 4, verse 11. John says that Jesus made and baptized more disciples, though he himself did not baptize, John 4, 1 and 2. So Jesus himself is baptized, and he carries on this practice in his own ministry before his death on the cross. Now after his death and resurrection, the Lord spent 40 days comforting and encouraging and teaching his apostles. Matthew and Mark record one of the important principles that he commanded them to teach and practice after his departure. And if you go to a familiar passage in Matthew 28, it says the following, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit 
teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what were, we, what were they to do? They were to preach the gospel and make disciples. How? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they were also to teach all of Jesus' commands, including this one, to their disciples who came and then who were to pass this teaching on to others. Now Kurt Nickham, um, in one of uh, the books uh, entitled The Restoration Movement and Baptism in the Restoration Movement, says something very interesting. Kurt Nickham is a professor of Bible at Oklahoma Christian. In the book he says, unlike priestly baptism that prepared a person to come into the presence of the Lord, or John's baptism that prepared a person for the coming of the kingdom. Jesus' baptism actually put a person into Christ and into the kingdom. Jesus' baptism wasn't to prepare, it was to fulfill, it was to complete. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, what was read before, the same command, but this time, Jesus establishes the necessity of obedience and the penalty for disobedience. Those who believe and are baptized, what will happen? They will be saved. And those who disbelieve, and if they disbelieve, it means they won't be baptized, what will happen to them? Uh, they will be condemned. And so, even though water was used in Jewish and Gentile religion rites, or religious rites, Jesus now takes this practice of baptism and gives it his own significance, gives it his own conditions. Without Jesus' stamp on baptism, I mean, it's just water, it's just symbolism. But as the divine Son of God, Jesus gives baptism its power and its true meaning. Because of Jesus' words, baptism becomes part of the Christian religion part of a believer's life, part of the apostles' preaching, something that can no longer be changed or neglected by man because now it comes from God Himself. And so let's move on now to the apostles. Jesus commands baptism, but He leaves to the apostles the task of preaching it, performing it, and also explaining it. And so the apostles begin to preach and perform baptism. The need to be baptized as part of a response to God's offer of salvation is found in all of the preaching of the apostles. In uh, the very beginning, the very first sermon preached at Pentecost, in the book of Acts, chapter two, verses one, all the way to 38, Peter's first sermon climaxes with the exhortation to be baptized as a response to the people's questions. They say, what shall we do? You know, we've crucified the Messiah, the Son of God, we're guilty of that, that blood is on us, now what do we do? And Peter answers, repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 22, verse 17, Paul's first action upon believing in Jesus, what was it? It was to be baptized. And during his missionary journeys, he baptized those who believed his preaching of the Christ in Acts chapter 19, verse five. There are more than 10 examples in the books of Acts alone where people who have heard the gospel respond to it by being baptized. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of something. You really only need one example of something in the Bible to prove your point. You only need the, the apostles or Jesus to say it one time for it to be the word of God. But God has provided 10 plus examples to demonstrate baptism's role and importance in the preaching and the response to the gospel. So they not only preached baptism, they also explained it. The book of Acts is a history of the early church and so it describes what the apostles said and what they did. As far as baptism is concerned, the apostles did as Jesus commanded them. They preached that people needed to be baptized and then they baptized the people who believed and who responded. 
It is left to the writers of the epistles to explain the significance and the meaning of baptism. For example, baptism as a, as a burial. If we want to see baptism as a burial, of course, we go to Acts chapter, excuse me, uh, not Acts, but Romans uh, chapter six, verse uh, three, where Paul, he's explaining baptism. He doesn't have to prove that it's necessary, but he does give some meaning to this act for his uh, readers. And so what does he say about baptism? He says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death. Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Now the word baptism comes from a Greek word, we've probably heard this many times, baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. The Greeks had another word for pouring of water, they had even another word for, the wor for sprinkling with water. So the fact that throughout the New Testament the word baptizo is used tells us that immersion or burial in water is the correct format for baptism. Why? Because if the Holy Spirit wanted us to pour, He would have said to pour. If He wanted us to sprinkle, He would have said to sprinkle. But no, He chose the word to immerse. And so when we say, how do we baptize? The answer is plain and clear we immerse. In Romans, Paul explains why this is so. The burial in water accurately stimulates, or simulates rather, the actual spiritual process taking place. He's saying when you're baptized, this is what's happening. It's not just that you're getting water on you. It's not just that you're getting wet. He's saying just as Jesus died and was buried, and then was uh, resurrected in, in, in glory to a glorified body, he says we die to sin and we're also buried, but we're buried in a watery grave and we're resurrected new creations who will one day receive the glorious body promised to us by Christ. Now there are many such explanations of the significance of baptism by other writers. For example, Luke says that sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit is received at baptism, Acts 2.38. And Paul explains that Christians enter the church or the body through baptism, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. And Paul also describes baptism as the way that one puts on Christ or establishes a relationship with Jesus, Galatians 3.26. And Peter says that baptism is the way that an individual appeals to God for a clear conscience appeals to God for salvation. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The apostles over and over explain deeper and deeper the meaning of this ritual called baptism. And so throughout the New Testament, the apostles preach, perform, and explain the significance of baptism. And through their efforts, the early church carried on the teachings and the practice of the Lord concerning this and other uh, facets of the Christian religion. <clears throat> so let's move, shall we? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's move on beyond the apostles. You know, we started in the Old Testament, Jesus, uh, John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles. Let's move on to the early church. Although the record of the preaching and practice of the apostles ends at the close of the first century, history records that the early church continued faithfully in their example and teaching. In the October 1996 edition of the Christian Chronicle, there was an article describing the architecture of not one, not two, not five, but 500, I repeat, the architecture of 500 early Christian church buildings from the third to the fifth century AD. And there were some interesting features about these buildings. For example, most of them were shaped in the shape of a cross and they used a style of Roman or Greek uh, administration buildings. A small building, for example, would be 60 feet by 45 by 20 feet high. Many were elaborate, had marble or polished floors, columns, high ceilings, and there were certain features of these buildings. For example, there were separate halls used for fellowship meals, usually at the back of the building. 
There were rooms to store items used for benevolence to the poor. There was a large auditorium with benches. There was a raised stage area with a pulpit and there were chairs where the elders would sit during worship. There were teaching rooms, they were called, we call them classrooms, and there were also elaborate baptistries, usually at the side of the building with connected changing rooms. Now these baptistries were very interesting. They were made in different designs. They were cross-shaped or round or rectangular. They were decorated with tile, with colored fish or water or crosses or grapes. And they all had stairs and could contain about four to five feet of water. Now here's the amazing thing about this discovery. Every, I repeat, every single building had a baptistry and every baptistry was purposefully designed to provide for enough water to immerse. The conclusion, of course, is that after the apostolic age, the early church continued its practice of water baptism by immersion as had been taught and performed by Jesus and the apostles before them. Now that's not an inspired source, that's a historical source, but the historical source confirms the inspired source. So let's move a little further, shall we, into the Middle Ages. By the fourth and fifth centuries, new forms for baptism, pouring or sprinkling, were introduced as the emergence of the Roman Catholic Church developed along with the doctrine of original sin. These practices grew and spread well into the Middle Ages until the Protestant Reformation. With the translation of the Bible, into the um, language of the masses, there was a return to the original biblical form of baptism by total immersion. Protestant reformers and scholars understood the original languages and meaning, and they began to reintroduce the biblical form of baptism into their religion, which was baptism by immersion. Although the Orthodox churches have always baptized by immersion, think about it, Greek Orthodox, why did they baptize by immersion? Greek Orthodox, they understood the Greek. <laughs> they knew that baptism was by immersion. It was never an issue with them. Now it wasn't until the restoration movement of the 18th century, however, that the churches of Christ restored not only the original form for baptism, which was burial in water, but also began to emphasize the original biblical role and purpose of baptism. The restorationists taught that it was at baptism that one became a disciple of Jesus, Matthew 28. That it was at baptism that one obeyed Christ, Mark 16, 16. That it was at baptism that one was born again, John 3, 5. That it was at baptism that one received forgiveness and the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 38. That it was at baptism that one was added to the church, Acts 2, 47. That it was at baptism that one was united to Christ, Galatians 3, 26. That it was at baptism that one had a clear conscience, 1 Peter 3, are you getting the point? It was thanks to the restorationists who put together the form and the purpose and brought these things together as a unified teaching. These were not new ideas. They were biblical teachings long ignored that were restored as part of the main teaching on baptism in the New Testament. And so we find ourselves in the modern era teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and including in that teaching the central role of baptism as the proper response of faith for one who has believed in Jesus Christ, repented of their sins, and is ready to become his disciple. The next step is to confess one's faith and to be immersed in water in his name. Now, one of the most asked questions when I study with people on the topic of baptism is, what's the difference? I mean, what's the difference between this group, this church's teaching, and this other group's position? Aren't they all the same? So as I close out my lesson this morning, let me summarize the basic belief of five major uh, Christian denominations 
and end with a summary of our own belief and teaching on the subject of baptism. Now please don't get the idea that I'm bashing somebody else here. I am simply explaining what other groups teach about baptism, period, that's all. I'm not making a judgment on it, I'm simply showing you what other groups teach. So let's begin, of course, with the oldest, one of the oldest, Roman Catholic and, and some uh, uh, Orthodox churches. In Roman Catholicism, the ritual of baptism is effective when administered by a priest. The power is in the ritual, it's called a sacrament. One reason why they baptize babies is because the power is in the ritual and the one performing the ritual, there is therefore no need for the consent of the one being baptized. The consent comes from the parents. Vicarious faith, that's what they teach. In most Protestant and evangelical churches, they teach that the ritual of baptism is only a symbol of what has already taken place when someone believes. In other words, the power is in the person's faith. Pentecostals. Pentecostals, for them, baptism is only a religious ritual that edifies the believer. The power is in the Holy Spirit who confers the ability to speak in tongues. And the ability to speak in tongues is the confirmation that the person has salvation. Jehovah Witnesses. The ritual of baptism is an initiation into the Jehovah Witness organization. The person is required to answer questions before it is administered. The power is in the Jehovah Witness organization that grants you entry into their community. As is typical of all sects, salvation is only for those who are part of their group. And finally, there are many more, but I've tried to pick the biggest ones, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. For them, the ritual of baptism is a response of faith and obedience to Jesus Christ, but must be performed by a Mormon in order to be effective. This is according to section 22 of their Doctrine and Covenants of the Book of Mormon. For them, the power is in the authority of the Mormon Church and the Book of Mormon. Basically, they have the same approach as the Jehovah Witness. You're saved because you belong to Mormonism. And lastly, um, I'll review one last time the Church of Christ. For us, the ritual of baptism is the historical context where God works. The point in time when His promises and His grace are granted. The power is not in the ritual itself. There's no magic in the water. The power is not in the person performing the ritual. The power is not only in the faith of the believer receiving the baptism, and certainly it's not by the power of words written by men found somewhere else than in the Bible. The power comes from God and it works in response to faithful obedience according to the New Testament. In other words, in Acts 2, 37 and 38, Peter says that Jesus is the Son of God who died for our sins and resurrected three days, three days later. And those who believed this responded in faithful obedience to His command to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. And for those who entered into the water of baptism on that day, God met them there to forgive their sins and breathe into their mortal bodies the presence of the Holy Spirit. All those who have had this similar historical experience need to take comfort in the joy and the memory of the day that they were saved. Someone says to you, when were you saved? November 1977. Why do you remember it as that day? Because that's the day that I obeyed God. He said to me, if you believe in me, repent and be baptized. And so I repented and I was baptized. That's why I remember it was on that day that I was saved. Not, not the day two years before when I began reading through the Bible. I believed in God, I was reading through the Bible. 
for two years and I had attended this church and that church and spoken to this guy and that guy and I was searching and yeah, Jesus, I, yeah, I believe Jesus, uh, he's the son of God, of course, uh, until somebody finally sat me down and said, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? And I go, well, yeah. So now what do I do? <laughs> and he flipped the pages to Mark 16, 16. I still remember that. It says, well, those who believe, which you do, and conjunction are baptized, quote, equals, you'll be saved. I said, okay, that's what I want to do. Bang. I had the faith. What I didn't understand for two years was how to express that faith according to God's will. And someone finally came along and explained that to me. And that's what we do. We're looking for those who believe. Many good people believe, but they are not clear as to how they should express that faith. And God has given us dozens of examples in the Bible of how to respond to that faith. So if there's anyone here today who has not had this meeting with God in the waters of baptism, I say to you what Ananias said to the very pious and religious Saul in Acts 22, 16, and now, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. So if you need baptism, baptism according to how the Bible teaches it, not how the Church of Christ teaches it, how the Bible teaches it, if that's the baptism that you need, if you haven't had that baptism, then we encourage you to come forward now to be baptized, to ask for more teaching or study, to answer questions, whatever your response is. Please make it now as we stand and sing.